Hello and welcome back to Catch and Cook California. I'm Kevin. This is video number 11 in my series, An Introduction to Freediving and Spearfishing California. Today, I'm joined again by my buddy Andrew. We're headed out. We're going to do some spearfishing, specifically looking for lingcod, rock crab, and giant red sea urchin. We're going to do a unique catch and cook. Let's go. Swell's definitely picking up a little bit, but it looks like there's decent visibility closer to the rocks, somewhere probably between 6 and 12 feet. 6 is not awesome, but it is huntable. If we can get 12 feet, then it's on. First things first, I want to talk about weight belts, and then we're going to jump in the water and see what we can find. So why would we go swimming and just cover our body with a whole bunch of lead weight? It doesn't really make any sense. The idea here is the suit itself is incredibly buoyant. When you put it on, it's almost like putting on a life vest. We need this for diving in colder water conditions because it allows your, your body to maintain its core temperature. But it creates a tremendous amount of buoyancy, so you need to put the right amount of weight on. Without a weight belt, if you were to put this suit on and try to dive down, you're going to float like a cork, and it's not going to allow you to do any kind of diving. So you need the lead to balance the suit. When you're neutrally buoyant, it's basically like going out and swimming in a river or swimming in a swimming pool or something like that with no suit at all. It's easy to be on the surface, easy to dive down, easy to come back up. So the general rule for a seven millimeter thick suit is 10% of your body weight plus three to five pounds will get you in the ballpark of the right amount of weight that you're going to need. The only way to really know if you're gonna be neutral though is to get in the water and actually test it out. So there's a number of different kinds of weight belts out there. This is made out of rubber. It's a little bit more of a new school style. The old ones were a nylon webbing and they didn't flex at all. I really recommend a rubber weight belt because it flexes. Once you put it on, you pretty much forget about it. And as you're diving down, we've been talking about this, you have to pinch your nose and breathe into your nose to blow air into your ear canals, your, your eustachian tubes in your ears, and that keeps your ears from hurting as you're going down. All the other air passages are also undergoing atmospheric pressure changes the deeper you go down. So if you go to 30 feet, you're under two atmospheres of pressure, whereas right now I'm hanging out, I'm under one. That means that any air pocket is being compressed. In the suit itself, in the neoprene, there are thousands of tiny pockets of air. The deeper you get, the more those compress. And as your suit compresses, it can free up a little bit of room between your weight belt and your body. That can cause your weight belt to slide all over the place. But a stretchy rubber weight belt will actually conform to your body the deeper you go. And as a result, it'll keep your keep your weights from sliding all over the place. There's a number of different types of clasps. This is the one that I like. I really like it because it's very easy to flip. The reason I like to be able to just flip it and have it come off is because rule number one in the water is stay calm. No matter what comes up, stay calm. You'll make more rational decisions and you'll keep yourself out of situations that could really hurt you or even kill you. Rule number two is if anything goes wrong at all, if you get caught up in sea seaweed or you get caught up in fishing line or something, drop your weight belt. So as always, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this bait bag down with a weight in it. I've got a float on the surface and a carcass of fish at the bottom. You can see immediately I've got a rock crab on that bait bag. This is a yellow rock crab and we'll talk more about that later on. Andrew got a, a red rock crab here pretty much right off the bat. We're measuring it out, but it was well over legal size, so we've already got one on the board. So just measuring visibility, it looks like we have about, yeah, between 8 and 12 feet, somewhere around there. Kind of hazy, but not terrible. On my first drop down, I found this ledge, and I kind of hung out next to it and just checked out the periphery. And pretty much right off the bat, I was greeted with a, a huge wall of perch. There were all kinds of different species of perch in here, some rubber lips, uh, some pile perch, uh, some black perch in the back there. This is always good to see, you know, in case of a zombie apocalypse, there's plenty of food there, but at this point I wasn't hunting perch, I was out there hunting specifically bigger fish. 
but always good to see. So I hit the surface and let Andrew know and he came over and made a drop. And the next thing I knew, we had the first fish on the board as well. No skunk. Yeah, dude. So the next drop down, um, you can see this visibility is still pretty hazy, but even on a hazy day like this, you just never know what you might see. There's a rock crab kind of hidden away over there, but what really caught my attention on this particular drop was this guy right here. This is the first laying cod that I saw on this particular dive. Now when I first saw this laying, I thought, oh man, that might be legal size. That's what I'm doing here is I've got measurements on my gun and I'm just holding it up you know, at a distance, sideways, looking at the fish, thinking, how big is this? Now, usually when I look at a fish, if I have to actually hold my gun up to measure it out, my general rule for myself is don't shoot. That means that the fish is close enough to the bare minimum that it's not worth taking the shot. But it's cool to see, and I wanted to show you what it looks like when I'm actually gauging a fish's uh, overall length. The more you do this, the more you're going to be able to realize what a legal fish is at the first moment that you see it and when a fish is undersized. In the Merc, I know you can't see it, but I can. This is a legal fish. Boom! <laughs> and the fight is on. It's thrashing around like crazy, and my main goal at this moment is I know I've got a good holding shot, but i got to get down in there, put tension on that fish, get my hands wrapped around it. And uh, once I got my hands on it, I realized I didn't actually need to get my hands in the gills because it was a very good holding shot. But the next thing I'm going to do is bring that fish and take a look at those chompers, will you? I think it'd take your finger off. Anyway, securing my knife and I'm holding it up to my gun just to show you the measurements. So right here is my zero mark and down the muzzle, this is my 22 mark. So you can see that this is actually like a 24 inch lane, maybe 25, well over the legal minimum size. Oh yeah, so when I wanna remove my spear from a fish, I actually fold down the flopper and then twist the spear and that allows me to take it back out of the fish. That's a ling, baby. No way. Woo -hoo -hoo. Yeah. Big one too. Woo -hoo -hoo. Uh, the stringer through his gills and out his mouth. Nice! Woo -hoo. Oh, well, after a solid celebration on a beautiful fish, I brought in my shooting line and uh, reloaded. So what I'm doing here is I'm just sliding the spear shaft back into the uh, locking trigger mechanism back here. You want to make sure the fins on top or grooves on top of that shaft are on top. And then I'm running the shooting line around the uh, line release down here. Once it's all set up, I'm going to pull those bands. The first band goes to the first notch, second band to the second notch. And you can see these bands are getting close to wearing out. I'm actually intentionally going to let them wear out so that I can show you how to fix a band because that is something that is extremely important for Spiros to know how to do. Check out this jellyfish. This is one of the coolest things. I love going in the ocean and I love hunting, but I love all the other things that you see along the way. It's a, a whole experience. So with a nice sizable fish on the board and some rock crab, it was time to make another drop and see if we could find any other resources. So at first I was looking around in some of the cracks and some of the caves and I ended up coming upon um, a few of these massive red sea urchins. So you'll see me reach down into this crack here and uh, a lot of times I don't even use the pry bar. I just reach in there and if I'm kind of quick, not too quick, you don't want to hit it hard, but quick enough that you can kind of just push it along, you can get one of these, uh, oh yeah, let me put my sea star back. But yeah, you can get one of these sea urchins pretty easily. Don't necessarily even need to pry it. So I got an urchin. I know it's purplish in color, but that is a red sea urchin. And uh, one more for the bag, one more for the pot. I passed this one up since we knew that the uh, bait bag was soaking and there was probably a lot of crab coming after it while we're working. But I saw this big red sea urchin decided to go for him instead. Look at the size of this thing. Remember, those red sea urchin can live over 120 years. How crazy is that? And here I am just marveling at the lingcod again. I realized in this video, it's the very first uh, lingcod that I have speared on the channel. I've speared more lings than I could possibly remember in my life, but this is the first one I've speared on the channel. So I was just absolutely beside myself. These are such delicious fish, and I've been wanting to share a, a lingcod spearfishing video with you for a long time. Now the visibility is not exceptional in this video, so I'm going to do another video that is more specific to how to hunt them, but uh, hey, you know what? A ling on the board, I'm happy. 
So uh, this was towards the end of the dive. We went back to that bait bag and made a few drops. And Andrew and I were completely blown away by the number of crab that we found around and on that bait bag. Just amazing abundance of crab out here. Here's Andrew grabbing two rock crab on one breath. And I'm dropping down here. And you can see rock crabs fighting over our bait bag here. They just do not want to let go. Look at the size of this guy. A massive claws on that. So that's a brown rock crab. But uh, we also got some reds, and then we also got these yellow rock crabs. And I was most interested in the yellows because I had never seen them before. And I wouldn't take them if I had only seen like one or two. But we probably saw 20 out there, maybe more, maybe 30. And so we ended up grabbing a few of the reds, a few of the browns, and a few of the yellows. Did you have a good time? Dude, excellent time. Thank you. That was super sick. Dude. Glad you got that laying. I'm so glad. That was a poor viz day and an excellent time. So many of these two we let like dozens go i don't know yeah easily a bunch of babies yeah we'll see how those taste they look great oh man gosh, yeah. they're huge, huge claws. look at those huge nice we got to figure out what we're going to do with that link cod too fish <laughs> and chips and look at those snappers will ya <laughs> there's an app that he uses called fish legal oh, yeah. and fish legal has all kinds of information on where you can fish, but how to identify one type of rockfish over another, a bunch of stuff, huh? Oh yeah, I mean, it has all the different species, the regulations, sizes, it breaks it down in each zone, so there's five zones in California, and there's also like the map area, so you can use your GPS, and it shows you where in relation you are to the nearest marine protected area or state MCA, and that's really useful, because I don't know, like, you going through all those government pages, it's really hard to find Yes. <laughs> the information specific to where you're at, and this one just kind of streamlines it all in one. I pay like 10 bucks a year, I think it's worth it. That's totally worth it. I back it. Fish legal, he backs it. Very, very nice. That's a lot of uni. So it's uh, the next day and I brought my uni out here after processing it. I've got my rock crab and I've got my lingcod. So I'm just gonna mix some uni into the rice here. Get a nice golden color, and then we're gonna mix a bunch of other goodies in there as well. I already smell the crab, and look at the color of that. Dash of sesame oil, not too much. It'll overpower it if you put too much. Some green onion. Salt. Furikake. Black sesame seeds. It's looking pretty good. Lingcod is just a little piece from the tail and it's marinating right now. So I'm heating up the pan. I'm gonna throw that thing on right now. I'm gonna put it flesh side down to start. Tongues of uni are like beautiful, just perfect. A little bit more of an amber color than that bright yellow, but 
I saw that quite a bit with the, uh, the large red sea urchins this time. Super sweet though, we already tasted some. That's going right up on top. Ooh wee, that's pretty. I need a little bit of salt for this scallion ginger oil. All right, let's see. First things first, I'll go for the crab. Never had yellow rock crab before. I'm figuring it's gonna taste like any other rock crab, but you know, this traditional scallion ginger oil, this is a Chinese kind of dipping sauce that traditionally is done with uh, chicken, but I figured why not? Give it a try with some crab. I bet it's gonna be good. Oh, it's good. It's real good. <laughs> Whoa. Hang on a second. Look at the meat on that. This is, wow. That is actually a beautiful pairing. Get some of those pieces of scallion and ginger on there. Dude. Okay, I thought this was gonna taste like a red rock crab or a brown, but the yellow is way more subtle. It's got that really kind of robust rock crab texture but the flavor is actually a lot more similar to a dungy. This is really, really good. Pocket knife time. Buck Ranger. It's got good pieces of brass on there. Thing's heavy as heck. Wouldn't take it backpacking, but works quite well for this. All right, all right. Here. That's all meat. Right on in all that scallion oil. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Hey, I can double dip. I'm the only one eating. Dude. Whoa. Go for yellow rock crab if you see them. Whoa. Lingcod. Use the knife so I can get a piece of skin on there as well. Get a little piece of that green onion on there. Um, I don't scale my lingcod because their scales are so fine that I'm just not worried about it. Um, I don't even detect them when I eat them. And I always eat the skin unless I'm doing fish and chips or fish tacos. Without a doubt, better than halibut, better than rockfish, better than cabazon. I love cabazon. Lingcod is my all-time favorite whitefish. That is such an amazing eating fish. My goodness. Here's a key for you non-Asian folks. The, uh, the ginger is for flavoring. Don't eat it. I used to do it too. Don't, don't worry, don't be ashamed. But all the Asian folks are like, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I learned that one from Diane. <laughs> the thing I like most about lingcod is, in comparison to say halibut, which is a fantastic eating fish, it's hard to overcook lingcod. It'll stay juicy, flaky, juicy, flaky, firm, but not dry. And so you can cook it in a number of different ways, including grilling it. And it just retains that juicy, wonderful, 
texture, flavor, everything. Mmm, that is divine. And the marinade was like the simplest thing in the world too. I mean, I, I didn't look it up or anything, it's just soy sauce. A little bit of rice vinegar, a little bit of water, some sugar, green onion, a little bit of a Asian hot sauce, some garlic, and then you just marinate it for like 10 minutes and then throw it in your pan. I could have put, instead of water, a little bit of beer. That probably would have been a nice like way to round it out, a little Sapporo or something, but whatever, this is fantastic. Uni rice. This is something Diane introduced me to. She's at work right now, otherwise I would absolutely be sharing this with her. big old hunk of uni, a bunch of rice. You know, growing up we used to get uni a lot. We would give it to our Asian friends um, and some non-Asian friends who loved it, but a lot of Asian friends really, really were into uni. And we always just kind of thought of it as a very, like, it was creamy, really rich, good, but I could only eat a couple bites. But Diane started making it this way, mixing the uni into the rice and then adding a few other flavors to it. The texture of the rice to balance that very creamy uni texture, it kind of rounds it out. You wouldn't make a cream sauce for pasta by just using cream. You know, you want to put some garlic and some salt and some herbs and like some tomatoes and kind of build it up so that different ingredients in the sauce balance the flavor and textures of other ingredients. And that's what's going on here. So if you if you haven't been an uni person, give this a try. Maybe you will be. Mm. Mm. That's pretty good. Pretty good, pretty good. All right, I'm gonna polish all this off. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Hopefully you learned a few things about free diving and spear fishing. I'm really hoping you're enjoying this series. I'm loving putting this together. I've been free dive spear fishing for 27, 28 years or something like that. I grew up having the opportunity to learn this from my dad and from my brother and to learn outdoor seafood cooking from my mom. Not everybody had that opportunity and that's one of the reasons that I love guiding this stuff and teaching people who didn't grow up with those opportunities. So if you're interested in this stuff, keep watching the series and uh, if you want to come out with me, catch the letter in cookca at gmail.com. Guided outings in the SF Bay Area and beyond. Until next time, keep the old ways alive. Try and get some of it in the bowl. It's windy. It's like... <laughs> Hang on a second. Why is that so blurry? That don't make no sense. Oh.